This next young man I've adopted as my son. And I discovered him many moons ago. He's an absolute genius. He's one of the oldest souls in the room. Robert can attest to that. His knowledge of consciousness is humbling to the extent you should definitely catch this. Don't leave yet. Um, it's almost as if he's footnoting his work by references that he drops, but it's not like he's dropping references. It just flows. And it, and it shorthands everything, and it just takes you down this vision. Rather than me gaslight, let's have the he himself knock our socks off. Michael Rose. And let me have your book so I can show it to the audience at large. This is the Rattles and other poems. It's an outstanding, miraculous collection. And I mean that, just drop dead miraculous. And this young man is a selfless soul. He's on the front lines of teaching young people our future. And I can just see him as Mr. Chips because he's a gentle, gentle soul. I love him. I make no bones about it. He's a great human being. Michael Rose. Michael. Yeah, we'll have to play the game. <laughs> cough, cough, okay. sniffle, sniffle. I suppose it's appropriate that I would start with, uh, I was going to begin with a poem called Dharana uh, in poetry. That's one of the states of consciousness, of mind, and, um, and Raja. Dhar Dharana in poetry. When the air turns into a mist, our senses at last shrink, at last dissolve. A white mist appears in little lines, diamond shapes and clouds flying forward and away. Ah, away again, it sweeps. The rug of the mind well beaten. Fall away, little spiders of dust. Poetry loss now comes commingling. Tired, inauthentic gold laid down like a bucket in the sand. Beyond our old wicked despair there in the cloudy, billowy heart of so little, little man. Um, um, I don't know why, I just want to read this poem. It's called uh, Tractatus uh, Logico Poeticus. It's based on, a, or at least it's a reference to, um, a book written by Ludwig Dickinson. I was a well-known uh, analytic in the school in uh, philosophical circles. So here it goes. Tractatus logico poeticus. An assumption hides. A river moves. Ships. Ships sail off the ports to sleep with civilization and build cities. Fast like loping cats. Pirates with their gold. Western and alone. She lights torches for me two miles away. I dream of her with her keen mind and moonlike eyes. She brightens my heart. Ah, uh, a woman is the heart of man. Man, the rib of a moan. Me, a man, a lovely clone and grumbly, thumping kingdom. What more might be said except to remember? There is a logic to everything. Absolutely everything. Alas, the world is ordered. Alas, the order is world or worlded. I have at last begun to understand Socrates, you know. Don't you know? You understanding is not a metaphysics or a metaphysic. It ain't no absolute. Instead, it loves a good game. Wittgenstein, I once read, 
was in love with the modeling of things right before the Tractatus was birthed. Well, that's what thinking is, modeling. Understanding, though, takes several of those models, pushes them off into a small pond, like they were numerous tiny paper boats, swimming mechanical fishes and fishermen, each boat a model. Look down there, friend. A trillion boats, ten boats, three boats. Isn't it something sweet and kind like nectar? People, we don't much like the end of stories. Do not like resolving the suspense, but ain't this little view of the boats a sure kind of nice and beautiful? The water runs, the boats swim and sing and soak. A music emanates from the ancient stoves of being itself. And because it must be, life ain't solved. Why would a little humility and vision of why we are ignorant invent an assembly line or direct all of history? It doesn't, and it won't. Dream with me a moment. Reach out and think of nothing but the end of this poem. Take with you its shanti, its peace. Like a bird's wing, a knife of the air. It is not unlimited, this little truth. It is sharp and smooth and of the little bird's life. The wing, it acts, the understanding is unlimited in its potential across all time, and it is limited across a lifetime's single loving. There now, let me fly to the lover of my life and dream in her curls, beside the boats of the pond, in ships of the river, and moon of her hair, in the damp forest of this fool, a simple mile or two or three away. This is um, it's called The Clock in This Room. I wrote this in Seattle really early, like 2 in the morning or something. Was, you know, everything gets louder, and, you know, you get more tired, and things just start to stand out, you know. So here's The Clock in This Room, 2 in the morning in Seattle. The noise is a beautiful one. It connects me to all noises. It shares with me all beauty. It connects me to the universe second upon second. And if I listen closely, I am connected to the universe beyond this one, the universe between seconds and far beyond my wonderful being here, right here, just here, in time. Where is time when a clock ticks and talks, hoots and whispers, whispers and hoots? Tell me. I feel time evades the clock and all those who are listeners to clocks. Me, myself, I am a timeless one here beside the beating watch, the thrumming keys in my infinite eyes. I sit in a blanket. It is green, white, blue, checkered, and patterned. I am a human being. I am a thinking midnight eye. My side has a pain in it. My head is achy, and my pulse is heavy in my neck. That is all. My head aches like the Buddha's temples ached before enlightenment. I perhaps remember myself then, my eyes then still green like this blanket, my toes cold now, but not then. One can only hope that if I rest my eyes quick, I will enter the great stream of streaming in love and be nothing, and want nothing, and stroll with gods, casually enlightening them on damp walks through the woods. Let me close my green blanket eyes and re return to my source, at last, at last. Let me hold this blanket like a grail and remediate the pains of my body that is perhaps not my own, but Brahmin's in another form. Let me sleep, yes, and ask, why can't I dream of the mist that floats above the pavements like an earthen spirit of the moon? The moon sheds light onto the window of my dreams. She harbors the deer who coyly dip their cool lips into the lake of the moon. And now the fish dream tonight. Perhaps they dream of me. Or rather, one can hope so. Truly, 
One imagines they dream of the mist that floats above the pavements, and the spirit that breathes the mist in and out like an enormous fisherman of the world. I dream of the gutter and the creatures that sleep along her mental shores. Spiders, insects, howl at the moon from the gutter, and crickets sing songs to them from the grasses. Water drips, and between its drips, all of these things transpi transpire. I dream, fish dream, pavement dream, lamppost dream, spiders dream, insects dream, water dreams dripping, dreams. And in this way, the world carries on beating as though on a pair of large drums, which beat on their own cells and which listen out to their, their low music, just beating, beating, beating like a gentle jostling of holy bones of sweet, deep lovers in the night. In the truth of myself. I am standing in the truth of myself. Folded, hands turned to cubic, mecca, arms flit like leaves into kneading palms that drink the desert. The earth drinks and gives time to me like pavements give space to vagabond feet. Um, and I thought I'd just read. Uh, I don't know if you guys will like this poem, but, uh, but I happen to just like this poem, because I wrote it. <laughs> so that's how it goes with poems, right? Alright, this is about my older brother. It's called We Were Brothers. It's a little long, so I'll probably just stop after this. It's not too long, but it is long. But not too long. We Were Brothers. Do you remember when we were wolves and we were boys? Once, when we were young beside the moon? When we howled outward, howled upward into prison lights beside the mountains. When we clowned around as ruffians and as children lost in the red of Mars beside the night. From Chelsea Cove, we listened in to the sounds of geese. And when we changed places, the bellowing of crickets and howls of coyotes. Beside them, we were there talking, a dance of midnight voices. I miss the voices, the jeer of words, the noises from our pack. I think about them many times while you stride into the different chambers of your life so far away, wandering in castles by a different, by a distant sea, in gravels of another roadway, in life songs that walk on distant currents much farther away than I would like from the simple syllables of our names clanking through the rooms and mental gearboxes of one another's holy ether. I think that I miss the noises most when I spill my words in meager poetics, or often I do not write of you. Therein, I fill my words like bowls with foddered clay. They are like writings on the wall, brother, and I miss you. There are pictographs charred into arched cave walls. There are hieroglyphics on the futures of our tombs and our corroded bones dug up beneath the tunnel of earth on our way to China. There are the sign languages of our fingers and the quiverings of coals from a heart music deep within the shadowy, pressure-compacted corners of lost diamond caves. Brother, you play onward in me like soul. And I miss you for every intellectual need. I miss you most when I think of everything we have lost and every parental dysfunction we have endured. I miss you most when I recall how I could not have been there when your heart had gotten broken, now so many moons ago. Yes, I understand it is all too tender to talk about as men. But it is okay, I would have said. 
The whips and lashes of love need salves of loving crowds when guillotines fall and our spirits falter to a fluttering halt. When pot numbs the emotions just when it substantiates our void. We are all lost most without the remainder of this world, I would have said to you. Yes. Yes, I would have seen earthquaked eyes, that rubble flat like cast buildings, tumbling like mumbling smokestacks and toppled love cities without stripless lights and hearts panting pantoon like beats within the dancing drizzled streets. Alone, I'd have said, we fail to fill. Slowly, we can become like nerves without the bridge between themselves. We do dull, become tilled, the still roots without their tree. And moving on comes in spite of jaded joy in withered spring. I love you, I would have said. I love you. I miss all the promises of brotherhood, the ones we knew but which now lay cast into titanic metallic gear, the stones of guns firing, the march of feet and the distance of Eastern Europe or Afghanistan or perhaps the sound of craning moons. But in spite of all geography, all the fire of our soul still burns up into the wooden handle, as it will always into the rubber of the souls, where insects crawl, prey, feed. We are brothers, as we will be always and always. All at once, I miss the disintegration of logs into soil, of my meekness into strength, with a thudding ache, I miss the ancient, derisive virulence of nature and hierarchy, the memories of our heated conflict, of our youth, of our play, and of our quarrel. We are imprinted by the irksome letters of the other's written dharma. And now, in spite of all of our quarrels, we are so similar, you and I. By the end, we are perhaps just something which I miss, because we were the prowl of time the true photography of brotherhood as it reeled on through the howl, the growl of the wild, on through a projector of light onto rain, on and on through the glowing dendrites of the brain.